Reasons Why You Shouldn't Sign With a Major Record Label, presented by Dr. Brian Cochran. This is brought to you by imusicboss.com. That's imusicboss.com. Who is Brian Cochran? Glad you asked. If you don't know, my name is Brian Cochran, and I am your host and presenter for today. I am the CEO of iMusicBoss. I've been in the entertainment business since 1975, 74 unofficially, 75 officially. I have managed groups. Um, I've promoted events. Um, I've done concerts, plays, you name it. I've owned music stores. I've worked almost every aspect of the music business from uh, working in distribution, working in sales and uh, marketing and promotion uh, by having my own company as a marketing company and business development company. I've worked with probably a couple hundred different recording, independent recording artists and then I worked with some major labels back in the 60s and 70s. I also uh, did some mix shows as a DJ for KJLH out here in California. KJLH FM 102.3 and uh, 991 used my mixtapes to get started, and I did uh, Cute 102 back in the day. So I've been in the music business a long time, doing various aspects of the business. Today, our webinar aim is why you should stay independent and how to stay independent. We may or may not get to that today, and then we won't get into this today for sure. Um, uh, there'll be another video after this one. Uh, how iMusic Boss can help you. But today, we're really going to be we're really going to focus in on. Uh, why you should stay an independent. Why join a major label? And I'm glad we asked that because most folks, that's all you know, and that's what you tend to think about is, I want to get a record deal so that way I can become global. I want to sign with one of these major labels. And uh, let's talk about why. There are three basic reasons why indie artists desire to sign with a major label. Let's take a look at that right now. The first reason is because of their expertise. Um, most labels, oh, actually all labels have the expertise of being in the music business for years and years and years and, and, and being in a situation where they're helping others to uh, be successful, to help them to, because they have a whole team of people because of the finances and resources to do so, they're able to do things that an independent artist is not able to do. So in the process of that, they want to sign with a major label so that way they have the expertise that they bring to the table. Number two, because major record labels have the finances, most independents are broke, and so and because they're broke, um, they need the finances or someone to help them with the finances in order to get themselves in position to to go to the next level in their in their business. Next, uh, they have the sales and distribution. Most independent artists have no clue what that means and what that is, and so what major labels do is they help. Get your music into the marketplace from if it's iTunes or back in the day, you know, it used to be record stores. Now it's digital. And so uh, they have the global distribution and a sales team and sales model to help a independent or an artist to be able to sell their music. Artists want uh, a major record deal because of the money, because of the leadership because they trust them, which we're going to get into in a minute as well, and because of their expertise. Even though artists sign with major record label deals, excuse me, major record label deals, you'll find that most 98%, between 95 and 98% record recording artists fail, even on a major label, specifically on a major label. Let's take a look why. Major labels are similar to what is called sharecropping, and we're going to get into that for a minute, and this is basics of what we're going to talk about today is, is sharecropping and understanding what that even means and, and how you as an artist need to learn the business. I'll say that up front so that we understand the importance of not being ignorant like sharecroppers were. What is sharecropping? Sharecropping is a system of farming, was, uh, was a system of farming that developed, that, that was developed in, in the South after the Civil War when landowners... Uh, many of whom had formerly held slaves, lacked the cash to pay wages for farm laborers, and many of whom were former slaves themselves. What they would do is they would work out deals with them, and uh, what they would do is this is how they did the system back then. Uh, there would be a landowner, and then there would be a worker, uh, one for the worker, and then um, one who, for who, whoever, provided the seed, fertilizer, and farm equipment. So what would happen is 
the problem was that the landowner owned the land, they possessed the tools, they owned the seed, they also owned the general floor, as well as all, all the supplies. So what would happen would be that a landowner would go, wow, what they, you know, they learned from, from some others that what we can do is, that because slaves usually then uh, did not know how to read or write, what they would do is they would take advantage of them because they didn't know how to read or write. And so they would say, hey, you do trust me. I have the land, I have the expertise, and I have the money to help you, even though they really didn't have the money. That's why they were doing it in the first place. But in, in this instance, they, you know, just pretend they had the money because they did have to store, they did have everything, and they would they'd have to go to the, 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 the farmer would have to go to the landowner and say, hey, you know, you know, I need your expertise, I need your equipment, I have the labor, I'll do the labor part, but um, let, let's, let's partner together, let's work together to make it happen. So what they would do is they would play on their ignorance, and what, what ended up happening is that the worker provided the labor, let me back up before I go there. So what would happen is just like in the, in the music business, you are, you are the artist and you provide the labor, meaning song, or you're the musician that played the instruments or whatever the case may be, or a combination of both. And so what would happen is they would, they would play on your ignorance of their expertise, they have the finances, they have the sales and distribution, and you would not have anything except for your talent. And because you trust them, they would sign you to a contract that they control you. And then we're going to get into more details about that. But the, the, the unfortunate part about the sharecropping industry back then was that most of the workers, the laborers, never came up because they were ignorant. The only one that really su succeeded back then is the landowner because he's the one that knew how to read and write. And so when you go to the store, um, let's go down. Let's, let's go down there. Let's take a look at that. They would play on your ignorance, right? Because, again... As an artist, you don't know anything, and so you, they, 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 they know you don't know anything. So they get you to sign a contract that you will not be able to understand. They say, "Oh, we'll get you an attorney. We'll get into that in a second more." But they, they, they take advantage of every chance they get. Sharecroppers, you, you, as a sharecropper, you are you trust the landowner. So if you look here on the left side of the screen, you'll see that there's an X. So back then, the owner would say, "Sign an X." Well, if everybody's signing an X of sharing, there's, there's working on different parts of the land, you wouldn't know if you came back and he would say, look, this is, these are your X's of the seed that you got from us, the water that you got from us, the farm equipment that you use from us. Um, by the way, you know, we put you up in one of our places, so we're going to charge you rent. And so all these X's, even though there were different people signing X's, but because you didn't know how to read or understand what you were reading, Guess what? They took advantage of you. Major record labels are piracy. It's an act of piracy. You're stealing an artist's work without intentions of paying you anything. Did you know that uh, major labels or corporations, and as a corporation, and most of them are publicly traded companies, that their obligation is to the shareholders and not you as an artist. And so because they are in control and their job is to make money, do you think they're going to be for you or against you? Do you think it's their job to make it fair or is it their job to make their shareholders as well as themselves as employees of the corporation money? In most cases, and 99.999% of the time, it is the job and they will do it every time. I've not seen too many that you know, until the person learns the business in 99.9% .9 of the tech cases, they'll take advantage of you because you don't know how to read a contract. You don't understand the business. You just want to play your music. And you just want to sing. Not to mention, you are just an employee. So each year, what they do is they, you know, they treat you as an employee versus being an owner. And that's one of the challenges of being a, being a artist on a major label is they you're you're one of many other artists that they really don't care about you. You just like you know it's like taking rice and throwing it up on a wall. Whatever sticks, they work. Whatever they don't, they don't. So as an employee, you have no say so over what they do with your project, how when they offer it to, or when they're going to release your project. How much money they're going to put into your budget, into the budget for your project, and if you're a new artist, you can forget about it. You know your your opportunities are really going forward unless you've already had a record already done, already out there in the marketplace, already generating some sales, already have some buzz. They're going to put some money into you. If you don't, then yeah, they'll sign you, and in some cases they'll sign you to uh, uh, to hold you back and not allow you to go be successful. 
Mages control every aspect of your project. Every aspect. They don't. They they control <laughs> everything. You have no control, as I stated earlier. The label controls what songs go on the CD. They control what songs are going to be released as a single. They control how much they're going to plan to spend on your project. They control your tour dates. They control when you take pictures. They control when you go in the studio. They control every aspect because, again, you are an employee of the company, not a employer. You're an employee. So you are limited to what you do. And that's okay to a certain extent, but as an artist, you want more control because you want to be in control. Maybe you know your you know your demographics, you know your people, you know who you're trying to reach and where they are. So say, for instance, you're a college artist. And as a college artist, you know that during the summer, it's a slow time and kids are out of school. Or if you're a high school artist, same thing. So you want to be from, from September to, to June or April, May, June are your target dates You know from, from, from that point forward. Because after that, June, July, August, in the, you know, in parts of September, it's dark because most of the kids are out of school. They're on vacation. So uh, labels don't necessarily care. They may they know those things, but at the same time, based upon whoever else is on the roster is how they're going to release or how they're going to treat you as an artist. They control almost every aspect of you and your artistry. Uh, music has, has themes, and it's so funny because... Um, I work with I work with a lot of gospel artists as well, and and it's funny because I've had gospel artists telling me that well the Lord gave me this song, and I want to play it on the radio, and I go well the the challenge of you know and I you know at first when I first got into it I was kind of nice about it, and then after a while I go you know what I can't be nice because it's there's a business side even to ministry there's a business side to even gospel or being a Christian, there's a business side. And so I did let them know that, you know, you, you wrote that song 20 years ago. It's not relevant today. You know, just because you wrote it and God gave it to you then, you didn't release it then. So it's, it, you, you missed out. So you have to go back in and remix it and update it. Like like right now, you know, auto-tune is really big in the industry. It's, it's very special in urban music is really, really big. There's certain sounds and certain themes, just like in clothing, there's a certain certain theme that goes along during the seasons that people wear um, that different designers will come out with that people will follow and want, to, and want to emulate. So it's the same thing in music, where artists will come out with a certain sound and that sound becomes popular so other folks will start to gravitate to it. And then what happens is radio stations Internet as well as most you know, most mainline radio traditional radio uh, traditional radio stations uh, will play songs that sound similar because they don't want to try to break the bubble. They're trying to sell songs that are hits and play songs that are hits. So if you don't write a song or be be at least a single or two or talk on your album are relevant, you want to take them where you want them to go. I, I'll, I'll use Prince as a perfect example. Prince will always put out a radio banger. A song that would just be crazy on the radio, and then once he catches a fish, then he can lead them wherever he wanted to go. He can clean the fish by taking them where he wants them to go. So you as an artist, the record labels, when they sign you, their whole goal, I got sidetracked, let me get back on point. Um, they encourage you to be general with your sound or generalize your sound because for them, it makes it easier for you to go along with the flow than to break the mode. There's only a few artists that they allow to break the mode and that's because they're already superstars. They've already established themselves and you know they were able to do it. But if you're a new artist, forget about it. They want you to sound like everybody else so you don't lose by comparison, that you gain a following because success begets success. And once they do, they will, you, you may have an opportunity later on to, uh, change your style or go where you want to go, but just know that when you sign a label and you don't come with already two billion hits on YouTube or whatever, and you already you don't you already got sales on you know iTunes or whatever, that if you come in as a new artist fresh and you haven't created anything, they may sign you, but they're going to make you work with their producers. They're going to create a certain sound that they want that they know it's more marketable and it may not be a part of your artistry. It's about them making money because that's what it's all about for them. Record deals have a devastating failure rate. And as I said earlier, uh, it is out of the night. You know, it's, it's about 99.8 percent of artists signed to uh, a record label and are and dropped before fulfilling their contract. Uh, a certain percentage are intentional failures, and so out of that 99.8 percent, even that 1.1, you know, that, that almost one percent that do uh, that are not dropped. 
um, they still end up failing because a, a bunch of different reasons, which we'll get into in a second. But just realize that um, people, when the record labels sign you, their job is to uh, fulfill the contract. And, and the, whatever the contract says, they always leave themselves an out. That if they don't do certain things, if you don't read, the, if you don't get a great attorney, that's the entertainment attorney that understands the record business or contracts, then they will get you every time because they will do intentional things that will cause you not to be able to get your project out, or they won't put any money behind you. They make you change management, attorneys, accountants, and so on, and that's so true. There's a there's a group that I that I uh, used to, that I, my very first group that I managed was called, they were called The Look, and they were an awesome group that, that are in the, they were in the, in the early 70s, excuse me, uh, early 80s, and it, that was during the sound of the, you know, the Prince time, kind of, you know, um, 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 sound that back then, and so their sound was something similar to theirs, and so, they came to me at the time I was on KJLH, and this is, in fact, matter of fact, it's 86, 87, 88. So anyway, and so um, at that time, I was really, you know, working a lot of big clubs in Southern California and, and DJing in Orange County and all kind of stuff in L.A. and so forth. And they um, we, they stumbled upon me, and we stumbled on each other, and, and I had a music store at the time, and... And so they came into the store to see about me selling the project that I and and originally they, the the song the tracking was off on the song and so they, they have, this is back when twelve inches were, were out and so in the process of doing that, they I told them look go back and remaster the song because the tracking is off so as a DJ I would never play it I would I wouldn't recommend it to anybody so they went back in the studio they only made a thousand copies which was a lot back then but at the same time it wasn't a lot if nobody was gonna play it so. It was worth it for them. So it took them about a month to, to redo it. So they went back, saved up their money, remastered it. And because they're producers, I told them, go to a different person to master. Don't go to the same person because they should have heard it and they didn't catch it. So anyway, so because of that, I mean, my honesty of letting them know that, and, and they talked to some other people and they said the same thing. So they asked me what I, what I helped them and what I managed them. Well, I didn't get a management contract because I wasn't a manager. I, was a, I promoted parties and I was a DJ. And uh, at that time, I'd already owned a couple clubs and that kind of stuff. So I was really busy on that side. But managing bands, I had no clue. But I just knew as a promoter that I knew most of the club DJs in Southern California. So I said, look, at least I can get you guys known in Southern California. So um, I took on the task of being their manager. And so I got them into all the hip clubs that were in, in Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, um, Inland Empire. Um, that I had access to and then some of the other clubs that I knew outside of California because of just the influence that you and the people that you know and network with in the industry. So anyway, so they got known enough that they ended up getting on radio because, again, I was on KJLH, so we got them on KJLH and we got them on, you know, several other stations because of just the strength of who I was. I was a billboard reporter, which is a whole other conversation for another time. So I had influence, so I was able to get them played. And then so they got they came to me one day and said, "Hey, by the way, we have an opportunity to sign with uh, Capitol Records. They're they're starting a new uh, subsidiary called Orpheus." Orpheus. And um, they said, "Well, hey, you know, what do you think?" And I go, "Well, you're just getting started. I would probably wait, but I'm not. You know, even though I'm your manager, I'm not signed to you. Um, that's my suggestion. I would just wait it out and try to build up more, more momentum." And so that way you can you can come in with more demands versus coming in begging. And they're like, no, 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 we want to sign. And so what ended up happening was they ended up signing with them. And the first thing that happened was, let me go back to the, to the last slide. They made them change their management company. They brought in attorneys and saying, look, we got some attorneys because you can't afford an attorney, can't, right? They says, no, no, we can't. So we trust you, so we'll use your attorney. And so when it when ended up happening is by them replacing me, who was for them and understood the basics. Of, I mean, I didn't understand everything about the business, but I understood enough of how to help them as for making sure they got a fair deal, that they end up getting what is called shelved. And so what happened was in being shelved was they signed with a label and they got a production deal and they got a three album deal, but it was based upon them having the keynote um, artist on that label succeeding and then they were going to open the doors because of them and how the finances to do it 
Well, they were working with Melba Moore, who at that time was kind of passe, and they were trying to revitalize her, and they just couldn't do it. They didn't have the resources. They had the resources, but um, they were, you know, again, everything's in themes, and so she, you know, they couldn't revive her, so they ended up getting shelved. Not to mention, because of their sound and because of how awesome they were in the show, they also shelved them because they were competition to some other artists that they had on Capitol at that time that they did not want them to, to steal their thunder, that they're going to put more money behind it. And if these guys would have continued to on the track that they were going to, they would have been nationwide and would have been the next time. And so they ended up shelving them intentionally because they were competition for labels, for, for artists on their own label. So we got to be, you know, so another reason why you don't want to sign with a major label is because they, again, they control you. And so since they control you, they are the ones that are able to mark your, 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 if you're going to be released, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to be promoted or if they're going to put any money behind you or put any emphasis behind you or not. Record deals uh, make cost a fortune. Yeah. Record deals. Yeah. Make cost a fortune. I don't know why I wrote it that way. I apologize. When you sign with a major record label, you are often signing away the, po the possibility of making any money off of record sales. Seems kind of backwards, right? Yeah, it does. And let's talk about why. Oh, let me stop here before I go there. So what happens is that the major labels will intentionally pad the books they will intentionally uh again because you trust them and it's their money and their resources in the contract they get what is called recoupables so the recoupables mean that they will get every penny back first before you make another nickel as well as the money that you get a lot of times they'll give you front money they'll give you what is called an advance and in that advance, with that advance, that money is for you to kind of live on as well as to buy equipment or, or go in the studio and do something. But most in most cases, this is a bad part about advance money. Because you have not been, you don't have a money manager, no one's ever taught you about money, you're going to go first out and go buy a BMW, go buy your, your Mercedes, go buy your big house versus taking the money and investing it back into your business. So when it's time for you to do business on the long run, you have not been prepared because of you not doing that. That's just a side note. But anyway, so they get all their money back before you make a nickel. And so the, the challenge is that uh, you really don't make any money because the, the, their whole goal is to keep you a slave like sharecropping. is just like we talked about earlier in sharecropping is that they are the ones who control everything. So since they control everything, so say, for instance, you want a million dollar video. Well, guess what? That million dollar video is not free. It's not, they're going to make an investment that they're going to take, you know, on the, you know, they're going to say, okay, well, but you know, yeah, that's a great idea. The video got 10 million spins, da, 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 but they want their money back and they're going to pad it on top of that. The production cost may have been $9,000. They charge you a million dollars for it because you don't know what you're doing anyway. You haven't learned the business. There's something called uh, the new 360 deal. I'm going to bounce around just for a minute and then I'll come back. Uh, the 360 deal is where before, when you used to sign a major deal, um, you would be able to, the record labels will make all the money on record sales. And then you would make, you'd be able to make your money on concerts and merchandise and TV appearances and being in movies and so forth. Now what labels are doing is they've gotten more greedy. And they're saying, okay, now we want to get paid for everything you do because we've branded you. We spent the money on you, even though they got the money back. But because you're not thinking that way, you're not realizing what they're doing, is that, you, you know, again, it's illegal for a sharecropping. You know, artists were able to get away with it where they made the money. And the, the smart ones, if you notice, the smart ones, which we'll get into another video another time, what they would do is end up getting the start with them and then going independent because they realized that, that the record labels are taking such advantage of them that they can do battle by themselves. Like, like the movie that's out, I can do battle by myself. Well, you can do better by yourself because you control your own destiny versus somebody telling you everything to do and cheating you all at the same time. Basically, a 360 deal is an exclusive recording contract between a record company and a artist in which, in addition to monies from sales of the artist's records, music, and label shares, the other income streams such as touring, 
live performances, merchandise, endorsements, um, appearances on movies and TVs and other, any other income streams. Not just some, but any other income stream that comes along, they get a percentage of. How much money does a record label make off an artist? I'm glad you asked. If you notice in the picture, uh, <laughs> you see the labels make stacks of money and <laughs> artist makes pennies on a dollar. All right, let's take a look at it. The percentage that you receive for each album sold is a negotiating point. But typically, it can fall anywhere between 10 and 20%. And the only time you'll see a 20% deal is usually when you are an established artist. Uh, most new artists get a royalty percentage at a low of uh, end of the 10% range is more common. So it's between 6 and 10% based upon what they think they can take advantage of you with. So... Uh, the royalty deal seems simple enough. If a CD sells for $15 and the royalty percentage is 10%, then the band or artist should make only $1.50 for the sale of each CD or album. Or album. Um, if your first album sells a million copies, your band should get uh, $1.5 million. That's not bad, is it? <laughs> Let's take another. Let's, let's talk about recoupals again. I want to get into more detail this time. Recoupal expenses. And what happens is, based upon what you're talking about, what we talked about earlier, let's take a little bit deeper look about recoupable expenses. Recoupable expenses usually include uh, recording costs, promotional and marketing costs, tour costs, music video production costs, as well as other expenses. So if they friended you money for a house or car, uh, also, your bonuses in most cases are recoupable. Um, if you need a, if you need them to provide a car to your different promotional events or events as a whole, they subtract that. Everything and anything that is made or generated expense wise on that project gets taken out first before you receive a nickel. Record labels charge artists a twenty percent breakage fee. <laughs> Record labels still charge this fee for breakage, um, even though we're now in the digital breakage. But now it's called digital breakage. And what would what happened is that back in the day, when CDs and sometimes CDs and albums, you know, I was just in the mall, um, outdoor mall, just recently, and, and a couple different places, and there's record stores that are still selling vinyl, and artists are still releasing vinyl as well as CDs. So if you go into Target or if you go to certain places or Walmart, they still have CDs and DVDs in their stores, and so. What will happen is that they hold back automatically 20% for something. So say, for instance, a CD breaks or an album breaks or something else that you guys are using as to, to sell, that that 20% will cover that cost. So even, and the bad part about it is, even if you do not, no returns, no breakage happens. Oh, returns is something entirely different. Um they do not refund whatever the difference is, the 20% they held back is one thing. Two, there's something called returns, which I didn't put in here, but I'm going to talk about it while we're right here. They also, what will happen is before you receive your money from record sales, they take, they take what they'll do is they'll wait 30, 60, 90 days to 120 days. They'll hold back paying you to see what returns will come back on physical products. Or even in digital products, sometimes you'll buy, you know, you'll download a song or download a ringtone or something like that. And even though it's still, believe it or not, they're still doing ringtones. Um, that they still wait for because there's they're still returns with digital. Sometimes they don't like the song, they don't like the version, whatever the case may be. There's a return. So again, before you receive some money, they also hold back paying you until. All these fees, including returns, are taken care of. Major labels are not your friends. They are to make money again for their shareholders. How can I stay independent and get the resources uh, that we need in order to stay major or in order to go forward? 
What if you can stay independent and have all the resources needed to build your business or label? Are you interested? If you are, you have music, you have fans, take the next step and get your music to the industry through iMusic Boss. And if you want more details, go to iMusicBoss.com and we'll gladly go over it. In closing today, um, it's better for you to stay independent because they do not like you. They do not... They're going to take advantage of you, and, and we're going to go into our next video uh, real soon on all the different artists that have filed bankruptcy because, one, they didn't learn the business, and two, they, they, they didn't take the business seriously, and three, because of the major record labels, and mostly because the major record labels are there not to help you but to make money off of you. This is Brian Cochran with iMusic Boss. For more details and more videos coming up soon, go to iMusicBoss.com.